السلام عليكم اهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بكم بعد الاكل والشرب ان شاء الله تكونوا انا بنفس القوه وبنفس العزيمه كما كنت هالصباح الان نواصل الحلقات النقاش والان سنتحدث على موضوع مهم جدا وهو السايبر سيكيورتي as the main challenge for the ICT industry in the next years. So for that, I uh, have a pleasure to uh, receive my friend in, in Tunis, uh, Mr. Mansour Shehri, and uh, he will be the moderator of this uh, session. Uh, Mr. Mansour, the floor is uh, for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's really a pleasure to be in uh, the beautiful city of uh, Hammamat, and uh, we really thank uh, Tunisia for the great uh, hospitality. And um, I'm very honored to be um, with the great uh, panelists with me today, um, starting from um, Mr. Inigo Herrera, um, the Associate Professor of Economists and from the University of Madrid, and most of you who worked with the ACTI know uh, our chair uh, for the ACTI and the great work that he's doing for the last uh, years and how he helped to improve indicators. Um, Mr. Uh, Inigo will uh, present to us the summary of the ACTI work for 2017. So uh, the floor is yours and we have uh, around 15 minutes. Yeah, uh, good, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I just wanted, first of all, to, to thank also the opportunity to be here presenting the results of the whole expert group on telecom indicators. And uh, I wanted as well, uh, as the chairman did, to thank the hospitality of the Tunisian authorities. Really, we are feeling perfectly comfortable here. Yes. So thank you again for the hospitality and the organization. Now, what I will be presenting is the work that has been doing uh, during the last year uh, both in the online forum, in several subgroups, that I will be more specific on them, and in two uh, ECTI uh, expert group meetings, together with the EGH, by the way, uh, that uh, were assembled during the year. So there is plenty of work that has been done and has been agreed also already throughout the year in the last, in the last two meetings. As you will see, the objectives, grossly speaking, are to improve indicators, you will see some examples, to redefine indicators, and to propose new indicators. And, you know, I think we achieved, uh, among all of us, we achieved quite a bit on, on, on each of them. Um, there was, uh, I have to say, the two, two things on methodological issues, so to speak. During this last year, there were three subgroups a group of people uh, open to everyone that uh, focused on one specific issue and later on came up with a proposal in the ECTI meeting. A proposal that was discussed and discussed and rediscussed and then later on converged and agreed upon. Uh, these three subgroups have worked wonderfully and it's a very good instrument, I believe, for the development of more focused discussion and focused proposals that we need to come up later on with. Right? Because sometimes, and you all have the experience, uh, in any kind of group where we are many, uh, you know, discussions go way, you know, uh, maybe a bit ambiguous. So we need uh, this subgroup creation has been extremely helpful, also in the age, I believe, uh, to focus the discussion and to make up a proposal, a formal proposal at the very end. And also for the consensus building, you know, this is very important for us. We try to make step forwards always, but always try in a consensual basis, right? So I think it was, it was more or less achieved. What uh, I will uh, talk about is these nine, uh, more or less eight topics uh, that I have put forward. The, there are several indicators, as I said. Some of them are improved indicators, some of them, of them are redefined indicators, and some of them are brandly new indicators. And at the very end, I will mention as well some words on the future work that is, is to be expected. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to say one, the, the, the first indicator that we were dealing with. Uh, more than a year ago, in the, the previous ACTI meeting, there was the proposal to talk about fixed 
network coverage indicators. I mean, one of the deficits that we are facing is the fact that we are not really measuring fixed or even mobile, I will talk about this later on, mobile in, uh, coverage, in, uh, not, not coverage, but deployment of the network indicators. There was a big deficit in terms of fixed networks. And we know that the reality is that the reality is that fixed networks are spread over very heterogeneously across countries. So we came up with the idea, why don't we create a subgroup, this was more than a year ago, why don't we create a subgroup uh, to, to deal with the issue, see if there is any interest, see how the people are doing it, by the way, in each country, because methodologies here diverge a lot, and see if it, it is of interest to end up proposing to measure fixed network coverage or deployment. For that purpose, uh, Joao Noronha, who is present here from Anacom, Portugal, I want to thank him really warmly, because he gathered up, he was the leader of a group, subgroup, dealing with these fixed network coverage indicators. And what they did was a tremendous amount of work, which was to gather all the different methodologies that many, many countries are using in measuring fixed network deployment. Methodological issues arise here a plenty. We won't get into them, uh, Joao. Don't worry about this, okay? But uh, there were a plenty of methodological issues, but we needed to converge and to get something done. So, uh, first of all, it is important. It was this was the discussion that we held in the ECT, and everybody agreed that it was important to measure fixed network for policy purposes, for investment purposes, for digital agenda purposes, and monitoring for many purposes, right? So we thought that, okay, let's, let's do it uh, and let's try to measure the, this fixed network coverage. You know that fixed networks may have very different topologies. They may be XDSL based, they may be fiber based, cable. We didn't deal with wireless but fixed networks. These are excluded for now at least, just not to mix. And so uh, the focus was on, on fixed network coverage indicators. And we agreed at the last ECT meeting to start collecting in the long questionnaire for, that you will all receive in like March, April next year. In the long questionnaire, they, are, will, uh, they will be asked, what kind of coverage do your fixed networks have? And this is a challenge, and we are aware of it, for all of us, because we all have different methodologies. Some of us, they do not measure this. But we need to make even approximations would, okay, be valid and it would be very helpful to really grasp this indicator. This is an important one. A lot of uh, discussion went on with, um, um, yeah, this indicator will not be included in the IDI so far. Uh, of course, a lot of discussion had to do with methodolo methodological issues. You know, you know that fixed network indicators, you can really grasp them from many points of view. You can go for operator's data, you can do your own uh, measurements, uh, you can rely on other type of measurements, right? So uh, there is a lot of scope for each country to organize the fixed network coverage as, as he wishes, but we need this data. And soon, huh? for next month, uh, next March, or so it should be, should, should be uh, provided. Um, there are two big issues, uh, among others, uh, uh, the, on collecting this fixed network thing, which is the fact that um, what is a fixed deployment? What is a fixed connection deployed? And it means to be available to the final user. Available, not active necessarily. And this is highly important for us to know. Uh, then, uh, what does coverage mean? What does available mean? What does deployed connection, fixed connection mean? And this goes for any technology. Yeah? Well, it means that the network provider is going to be able to provision, to offer, or could provision the last mile connection, the very last meters of the connection to the fixed wire network within, and the household, of course, within a very short period of time, few days, and without the need of any extraordinary commitment of resources. Hence, availability means that the network connection fix is really available, if not at your home, very, very close to it. And this means deployed connection, which is what we are aiming at measuring. There is another big problem, which means, uh, which is, has to do, as you know, with the overlapping. You know, in some cities, in some densely populated areas, as you know, there are several, two, three, uh, even more fixed networks deployed already. We don't want to count twice or three times the same household or the same uh, unit, right? 
So uh, the, this overlapping problem, it depends a lot on the methodology that you are measuring, uh, that you are following, and it depends a lot as, uh, as well on the geographical unit that you are using as the base method, right? But uh, we, are, uh, we tend to assume that unless you provide uh, fine information on it, the overlapping should be perfect. Hence, you will pick up the coverage of the biggest deployed network operator in place. Uh, now, don't, don't worry much because there will, there will be a methodological document that will be provided to all of you based on the work done by Joao Nor Nor Noronha and uh, the team. Uh, there will be a methodological document to be distributed to everyone so that at least some issues are clarified. Huh? So this was one, which is, a, I think, a big advance on, on it. A second big set of discussion topics had to do with OTT, IP convergence, and IoT, the Internet of Things. As you know, behind these, these very nice keywords, there are hundreds of topics and problems and, and measurements possible. We are, and this is a recurrent topic in the ECT. It comes up very often, really, the discussion on this. Uh, now, we, were, we, we started from a very empirical observation, which is, you know, all, some OTT services, they are clashing with traditional services, and they are even replacing them. Absolute substitutability among some like you know, voice of IP, video calls of IP, uh, content of IP, you know, many. So what we thought was, what do we have? You know, what are people really measuring in terms of OTT services and IoT? And uh, the problem that we faced, and this was very clearly stated, I think, in the last ECT meeting, correct me if I'm wrong, it was that the national regulatory authorities, usually, they lack the legal competence to really demand, require data from this OTT operator to be provided to the regulator. Hence, this is a reality, and it was pretty much general, not in all cases, of course. So we, we started discussing about this, remember, in the last ECT meeting, and at the end, we decided two things, which was, why don't we split, because we have too many things behind OTT, IP convergence, and IoT, we have too many things here behind. Why don't we split up the discussion a bit between the OTT services on the one hand and IoT, Internet of Things, services on the other hand. So we will have like two different discussion topics in the online forum. This on the one hand. And on the other hand, and this goes uh, in, in, the, in the perfect collaboration that we have between the ECT and the EGH, we suggested that maybe from the demand side measurements, the EGH could take care of the discussion on how uh, users use OTT services, at least a few subset of them. So this was more or less the conclusion that we reached at the last uh, ECT meeting. Five minutes. Thank you. Now, then, then I will run. Another topic that, uh, thank you, another topic that was widely discussed, and here there is a big leap forward, I think, I believe, and uh, is, it has to do with wireless spectrum allocation. Right before I was talking about fixed network coverage, well, okay, there, there is no measurement being provided at the world level on spectrum allocation availability. And uh, we discussed about this, and we thought it was important to really develop some measurement based on this. So uh, since the topic is kind of complex and we need some collaboration among other branches of the ITU even, so it was decided to create a subgroup that from now on and, 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 and for, for, the, for the foreseeable months will be working on some proposal for fixed spectrum allocation or assigned uh, spectrum that uh, everyone has. So I expect this is a big challenge as well to collect this kind of information. It's not that easy. So I expect everybody cooperates with this. And, in, uh, and there will be more guidance on this. And it will be discussed, of course, before implementing it. Right? Most probably in the subgroup, of course, we need the collaboration of the ITU Telecom Development Bureau and, of course, the Radiocom Bureau. And everybody, by the way, is free. It will be free because it, it didn't start yet to join the, the subgroup. Now, another big leap forward was the revision of the ICT price data collection and methodologies. The price data collection, you know, is highly important for all of us. There was a tremendous amount of work being done year after year on price, comparing prices among countries, which, you know, is a highly complex issue. Huh? So, and there was the belief that we needed to update the baskets and the methodologies itself. So there was a subgroup as well created that worked during the whole year uh, that was led by Sasna Suile from Sri Lanka, from, from Lean Asia. She, cannot, she couldn't attend the meeting, but I also wanted to thank her because they, she produced a very nice paper together with her team on a proposal. And the proposal goes like this. 
basically means we were like flexibilizing some issues. Like for example, now you will be picking up tariffs based on the most on the mode of contracting, con contracting the service, and I'm talking about mobile services. So you can pick up prepaid or contract type of services, depending on what is the majority of the contracts in place in your country. The benchmark, of course, will be based on the least expensive offer. Of what? Well, of several baskets that we redefined, we updated many, many baskets. But not only updated them. As you can see here, there is some, some novelty here, which is we introduced the bundle, which I, we thought it was very important to pick up, the bundle of mobile services, voice, together with data, broadband, together with voice, in mobile, uh, we, we define a new category uh, to be collected on prices, tariffs, so that we can compare across the countries. We also redefine the um, expected minutes of use of voice, of SMS, and of data. We define a low and a high consumption basket. And for the rest, we kept only the data-only mobile basket, which is important for many reasons. And we kept as well the only voice uh, mobile basket, right? And besides, we keep measuring the fixed uh, broadband um, um, basket, right? We, which we redefine a bit the levels of consumption. Uh, this was a big, uh, we will monitor as well the bundling because the bundling is becoming prevalent all over the world. So we'll be, uh, and this has a lot of implications for the baskets, for the averages, and for the benchmarking exercise. And, uh, and also there was the compromise to review the ICT price baskets periodically. You know, we don't want to, per to review it only after seven years, right? So let's see how this works, but this was a big improvement also that we agreed upon in the last tech team meeting after some work. Huh? Now, there was also the topic on uh, should we redefine broadband? What is broadband? Is it 256 kilobytes per second? Should we define it at four uh, megabytes per second thresholds? And there was a lot of discussion going on on this. But at the end, we decided also for practicality reasons, I think, to keep the definition of broadband as it is and reporting it as it is, which is 256 kilobytes per second for mobile as well as for fixed. But what we did was an improvement in terms of the speeds of the broadband, fixed broadband connection that you are enjoying. And you know that we had only three intervals before. We have only from two, 256 up to two megabytes, from two megabytes up to 10 megabytes, and then from 10 megabytes up, we had the third category. Well, now this third category, we are splitting it up in three branches, which I think is important, which is the branch from 10 megabytes to 30, from 30 to 100 megabytes, and up from uh, 100 megabytes up to, to infinity, uh, if you can. So this will be the new three uh, broadband speed tires that we are gonna be using up from next year. We are aware that some countries, because there was a lot of discussion on this, may have difficulties in collecting this data with these precise uh, speed thresholds. So we, uh, for these countries, they can keep, for a couple of years, they can keep the old thresholds that they are the ones that I'm showing you here for, for a couple of years. Huh? And of course, uh, uh, in the IDI, it will not come the new version of, of the speed tires. Now, there was a lot of discussion on cybersecurity indicators. I guess later there will be a presentation on this. Uh, this was an important topic. It was raised in the last tech meeting. We, at the very end, what we ended up concluding was that there is no one single measure. There is no one single indicator, really, on, on cybersecurity we couldn't rely upon. It is a very sensitive sensitivity issue. <clears throat> Um, cybersecurity is being measured in some countries in very heterogeneous ways, from very heterogeneous institutions, sometimes public, sometimes private, sometimes you don't know. Uh, so this topic, at the end, uh, we faced a huge difficulty in trying to get one or two indicators that would, would potentially be comparable. We couldn't find them, really, at least for the time being. So what we end up concluding was, again, that maybe from the, maybe from the demand side, if we narrow down the cybersecurity topic, maybe we can find some measures of what individuals, the users, are really doing in terms of cybersecurity. And on this, I recall the, the previous presentation by the OECD, which had some very interesting uh, suggestions on this. And we want to explore, but more from the demand side, what can be done potentially on cybersecurity. Now, the last uh, topic before the future work that, uh, that was dealt with was in a previous extraordinary meeting in March that took place. We gathered uh, the ECTI and the EEH all together to redefine, to improve upon the IDI index, which I know that is a matter that uh, matters a lot to everyone. So we had a joint meeting, and there was a subgroup, uh, by the way, led by Rati, who is here. Thank you, Rati. 
uh, who came up with the proposal at the end, it was longly discussed. And, and you know, I'm, I'm being conservative here. You know, it was the lengthy discussions. So at the very end, we ended up concluding and agreeing on a set of indicators that would improve the IDI. The main ideas are the following. One indicator has been dropped, one, uh, two has been dropped, one has been redefined, and five are new. And we are coming from 11 indicators up to a set of 14 indicators that are gonna be used from next year onwards in this IDI. And let me, well, in the indicators, the structure itself doesn't change. We have access indicators, usage indicators, and skills indicators, which I think is a very three-pillar, very interesting three-pillar category to construct the whole index. And what I would uh, advance to, to some of your comments is the fact that why don't we, ju we just decided upon this. Why don't we just let it go and see how the properties are and see what the deficits are, which there will be, you know, and see how over time we can improve upon that. But, you know, let it go for a while you know, uh, because it, it, we just change it, and we cannot keep changing an, an index uh, every year. Huh? But again, uh, welcome any kind of discussion. On the future work, this is the last topic, I promise. On the future work, uh, I, I, I insist that there, uh, this is open to anyone who wants to participate. There will be a subgroup to be created on what spectrum, allocated spectrum uh, and capacity all over the world. And this, this is going to be a big leap forward, I believe. There will be a, a topic on quality of service. There is a lot of demand on quality of service indicators. Uh, and this topic will be open in the online forum and also for the, for the future meetings. Now, 5G-related indicators and IoT, Internet of Things availability, which we think they, they are related, they, this is opened up as a new topic for discussion, for suggestions, for indicators, for experience sharing, for many things in the online forum and for the next meeting as well, and also for experience sharing indicators on OTT, which there is a huge demand on them. The problem is that they are too heterogeneous and they are difficult really to get. Right? So uh, I, uh, let me finish just by, by thanking you for your participation and by encouraging you, please, to do participate in the ECT-EGH meetings, do participate in the online forums, do make suggestions, experiences, indicators, problems that you face, because this helps a lot coming up at the very end with a nice set of results. And in my name and under the name of Annie Baldeo, who couldn't show up here, the Vice Chair, I would just would like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Inigo. I would like to thank you uh, uh, for the, being a chair for the um, ACTI, and also the thanks to Alexander from the EGH um, for um, uh, uh, your great work that's uh, been announced in the World Telecom uh, Development uh, Conference in Argentina. Um, it was uh, mentioned, uh, uh, the resolution number eight, that the former mandate for the, the group and it um, uh, was approved by the city, I mean, by the country members. So thank you very much for your work and for Alexander as well. Uh, now uh, we're going to move uh, to uh, Mr. Salvio Di Nicola. Uh, and uh, he, um, he is the officer of um, AG, uh, AGCOM from uh, Italy. And uh, he will uh, be uh, presenting um, uh, the new matrix for broadband and uh, cybersecurity. So um, please give him applause. Uh, that is. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So. This is uh, the outline of my presentation. I will start uh, discussing about uh, broadband metrics, and then we will focus on the Italian project Misura Internet. When we discuss about uh, broadband metrics, uh, we don't uh, specify a single well-defined metric. Actually, we speak about uh, uh, many different metrics. Uh, for example, in the picture I've shown just three of the principal metrics, uh, that is bandwidth, loss rate, and uh, delay. But uh, there are a lot of other uh, metrics that affect uh, uh, broadband performance. Uh, 
for example, if you ask to online video gamer, they are fanatic about the speed, and they can uh, tell you hundreds of parameters that can affect uh, your speed connection. But if you uh, give hundreds of parameters to consumer, probably uh, you are not increasing uh, their benefit. There is a trade-off between information overload and consumer metrics. So uh, what you obtain probably is a digital tower of Babel. This is a, a picture from um, the cover of a journal of the Computation Machinering Association. And uh, they've noticed that there are, in the computer science, uh, thousands of different languages that can um, um, help two computers to communicate. But from a regulatory point of view, what uh, you should uh, obtain. You should uh, have a different report that uh, explain broadband metrics, but uh, they have a different um, approach. Uh, for example, you have a project about a university or a private company, but they have different purpose from um, the regulator. From a regulatory perspective, you have three main objectives you want to increase awareness in consumer because a lot of time consumer don't know uh, what really affect the performance of your uh, uh, line. Sometimes they think that uh, if there is the name uh, fiber in your commercial offers, this means that you achieve uh, the full speed. But a lot of time there are other parameters as we see uh, that uh, affect your performance. So first concern. Then, oh, sorry. You want to uh, facilitate to compare offers because now quality is uh, um, uh, something that uh, can uh, lead to a higher market share because now uh, the fight is uh, among operators on the quality more than on the price. And finally, probably this is the most important thing, since we are an authority, uh, we can certify uh, the speed that uh, you can achieve. If you read uh, one of the reports of other company, private or public, you don't have a certification of uh, your speed. Instead, with this project, we will see you have a certification of your speed. So, uh, this is a project that started many years ago in uh, 2006 because uh, we needed to um, have the collaboration of all the operators, not only of the major company, but also of the small operator. So uh, we built this uh, technical board and all operators participate to uh, this board and the sharing ideas, fighting, but finally we reach an agreement on the uh, technical and also on the uh, financial parameter because you need to <laughs> found this project. So what we decided to measure, we measure speed, delay, uh, packet loss and service availability. This is the four parameter. Um, actually we need to collect a lot of sample and uh, uh, you don't need to collect uh, samples just in one time slot because uh, as you know, the network load can change during the day, so you need to collect sample in different uh, moments of the day. After 24 hours, uh, the procedure uh, is finished and you have to collect all the sample. Then uh, you uh, cut <laughs> the tails and you, um, uh, so you can evaluate a part of, uh, from the average and the standard value, also the guaranteed speed, that means uh, the lowest percentile, and also the maximum speed, the highest percentile. From an architectural point of view, uh, we have adopted two different uh, type of measure. One centralized uh, measure that is done in the internet exchanges point, and another uh, type of uh, measurement that is done on the uh, client side. This means on the computer of the end user. So uh, when you are an end user, you go to this uh, website, uh, Misura Internet, and you have a public area where uh, you can download general information about uh, discussion, frequently asked question and definition, and a private area. In the private area, you can register with uh, your profile and uh, um, what is most important with the name of your commercial offer. Then you can download the software and uh, to start to run uh, the software on your computer. Uh, before starting the procedure, the computer check that some of the previous parameters that uh, we already mentioned 
uh, are not influencing the measure. That is, uh, for example, the CPU or uh, the hardware or the Wi-Fi connection and so on. After this first uh, check-in, it starts the measure, and after 24 hours, it ends, and you obtain this certification. So, uh, when in most of the cases, unfortunately, the advertised speed is different from your uh, certified speed, you can ask uh, to the operators to upgrade your uh, speed, or uh, you can withdraw from your offers without penalty. You have these two options. So, uh, this is what happens on fixed broadband lines. Uh, but, of course, during the years we evolved with uh, this project. And uh, now we can also provide measure of a mobile network, but with a different architecture also because, uh, you know, mobile network is different from a point of view uh, from fixed network. Even uh, meteorological <laughs> um, uh, aspect can influence your measurement. Um, another thing that we have uh, done is to uh, simplify this procedure. Now it, it's no more 24 hours because it's a long time uh, for a user to wait for the certification. But uh, there is a speed test that in uh, one hour can uh, give you the certification. And finally, we are testing, and uh, probably next month uh, we will release this new version of the software, uh, broadband lines above uh, 30 megabit per second. So we are aligned to the new indicators uh, presented by Nigo. Uh, so um, what is the remark and the conclusion? That now competition is uh, no more on price, but it's shifting towards quality. A lot of mobile companies, they advertise that they are uh, the speedest uh, uh, network operator uh, um, without a certification <laughs> by, by us. Um, another thing that uh, with this huge project you need to uh, develop uh, deeply technical aspect. You need technical board and discuss among all operators, not only uh, between uh, uh, the incumbent and the other uh, operator, but uh, you have to convince all of them that uh, uh, what you are doing is something that is beneficial not only for consumers, but also for operators. Also because they have to pay for this project, so <laughs> you need to convince them. And finally, uh, since, uh, uh, as you know, technology <laughs> run uh, more than regulators, you need to uh, monitor your uh, monitoring system. Uh, I remember when we started this project in 2006, uh, for us, uh, uh, 30 megabit was uh, the maximum achievable uh, speed, and no one uh, had this uh, type of line in Italy. But now, 30 megabits is not more uh, sufficient uh, for the market. So finally, uh, some reference. And uh, this is the last slide that I hope <laughs> you can enjoy more than the presentation. I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Silvio, for a very, very interesting um, subject and the new matrix. And um, uh, now we're going to pass the floor to uh, Sirin Tilly, the CEO of National Digital uh, Certification Agency of uh, Tunisia. Uh, she will have a presentation uh, on the measuring cybersecurity uh, effectiveness. So the floor is yours. So my presentation will be dealing about how to measure cybersecurity effectiveness. Um, so now it is needless to say that uh, ICT and broadband are key drivers to economic growth, to drive economic growth and enhance uh, well-being. We have a lot of people doing shopping on the internet, banking, water and electricity supply. Also, we can find them on internet, social networking, etc. And all these changes that happens to our society. Well, actually, it is bringing with it a new set of challenges, like cybersecurity challenges. How it, we need to know: Are we uh, ready enough for this uh, digital, new digital world? Are we protected enough against security threats? So, if we want to be able to know whether we are um, uh, secured enough or not, 
if you want to manage your cybersecurity, you not to be able, you need to be able to, to measure it. So something that you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. So here I'm giving you some statistics taken from the European, uh, the European ENISA, sorry, the European Network for Information and uh, uh, Security Agency, that shows that the main challenges now for defining indicators is to identify appropriate indicators for your system and network. So you need to measure your security, but you do not know how to do it. You do not know how to choose the indicators to be able to measure the security. And you also do not know what is the, um, like say, uh, data to collect. What is the needed information that you need to collect in order to be able to measure whether you are ready enough to go on internet and to do some electronic transaction. So we need to build up a framework of indicators that will be able to tackle with these two main difficulties uh, to find security indicators. So if we are talking about security, cybersecurity indicators, we can split them into three main categories. We have the country level categories. As an example, we will show in the coming slide the global cybersecurity index developed by the ITU. We have the individual level. Are you comfortable enough to do electronic transaction, to do banking on internet? So this, this deals about individual um, comfortable. Are you comfortable with that? And as an example, I give you the Eurobarometer on cybersecurity. And for the last uh, level, it's the organizational level. And as an example, we'll show the information security indicators developed by the European, the ETSI standard uh, institute. So these um, cybersecurity indicators actually are moving from the quantitative indicators, um, qualitative, let's say, the country level, individual level, we'll see that it is more related to qualitative indicators, whereas the organizational level, it is more based on quantitative uh, indicators. So for the ITU Global Cybersecurity Index, it is divided into five uh, categories. We have the legal category, are you, do, do a country have enough legal institution and frameworks uh, to deal with cybersecurity? Is there enough technical institutions and framework to deal with cybersecurity? Uh, Is there a policy coordination and strategy related to cybersecurity? Is there enough uh, research and development and training programs uh, related to cybersecurity? And is there also enough cooperation between countries to share information related to cyber security? So these are the main five pillars of the GCI developed by the ITU. And um, from the survey that they have conducted on the 193 member states, they, they have raised this map that shows the level of commitments of countries. And the highest level of commitment is the red color, and the, the, the lowest level one is uh, in, the, in the red color. So just give you an overview of how countries are dealing with cyber security. And now we move to the other level that is related to the user. You need to know what is the attitude in the, in the case of Eurobarometer, they are measuring the attitude of European towards cybersecurity. Um, what is their feeling when they are using internet? And from the statistic that collected during the survey, they, it shows that cybercrime is actually at the same level with drug trafficking and with terrorism. They are giving a high importance to cyber terrorism. So authorities and government have to put enough measures and enough um, work in order to, um, to supply trust and confidence in users that are using internet. And another interesting information also that you can see in this special Eurobarometer is that the most important thing people are caring, um, are actually giving importance to, is their personal data. They do not want that personal, a misuse, to have a misuse with their personal data and also with their money. When it comes to paying and bank information, these are the two most important information that European people are carry, caring about. And on that point, I would like to point to, to stress on something. It's related to personal data that recently Tunisia has ratified the Convention 108 related to the protection of personal data, just to show the commitment of uh, our government to, to do protection of personal data. And in France, they are working now on a new regulatory framework, the GDPR, in order to protect people when they are giving the information to, to, um, to organization and to, to banking account and some other examples. 
Now we move to another kind of indicators. It is more likely to be quantitative indicators. You need to measure, as an organization, you need to measure to see whether your cybersecurity tools and cybersecurity processes that you have inside your organization are enough in order to guarantee uh, a good level of assurance in order to make sure that the cyber security is effective and that the, it is worth the investment that has been done and to benchmark the effectiveness of security measures. And we need to have a framework that will be recognized and re with reliable statistics. So with the ETSI, the information security indicators, there, there's a, a huge documents that have been developed by the ETSI. We will focus on the IC01 uh, that will give you a full set of operational indicators uh, for organizations to use to benchmark the security, uh, to benchmark the level of security. Uh, there's around 100 uh, set of indicators, but in order not to get lost within this 100 set of indicators, you have another guide that will tell you what are the indicators that are relevant to your activities, that will guide you to select the relevant indicator for that, and, and to help you to, to raise up uh, an assessment that is really tailored to your, to your needs. And there are some other also documents related to that that will be able to, to see whether your security operation center is secured enough, are you capturing the right information, are you dealing correctly with the event related to cybersecurity. But we will mainly focus on the two main, uh, the two first part of the IC, um, IC indicators. So they are split into two categories. We have the security incident categories and we have the vulnerabilities categories. Actually, an attacker, when he is targeting an organization, he first of all, he'll try to look for a vulnerability, for a weakness in your system, in your network, and to take advantage of this vulnerability in order to, to, get, to gain access to your network and to your organization. And in that case, you will have uh, a security incident that you need to deal with very quickly. So I will give you some, some details, some examples of these, um, these indi indicators. For instance, as a vulnerability indicator, uh, we have, for instance, a system that has not been patched. As you know, there's always some vulnerability that are um, discovered in operating systems, in software, and so on. And you need to make sure that you have the appropriate patch to deal with this vulnerability to eliminate this vulnerability from software and from your system. And you need to have a security policy that will tell you how to apply the patch to your operating system, to your software. Okay? And you need to make sure that the security policy is followed and that you are doing the patch in, this, in the limit of time that has been defined in your security policy. Another vulnerability is related about passwords. Using weak passwords is not good for, to protect your asset. So you need to have also like sort of a policy for the password to, that will tell you how long the password should be, what are the characters that should be put on the password and so on. You also have workstations uh, that are not protected with uh, antivirus or firewall. And you know vulnerabilities on workstation are to be taken care of very carefully because this is how uh, ransomware actually will be introduced within the workstation. And this is how companies can lose a very huge amount of, of money. So these are kind of indicators, as you can see, they are very quantitative indicators. And they will give you like a precise image of the security of your, of your system. Okay. Another example of indicators related to security incident, in that case, uh, the, the, the damage all has already occurred. So denial of service attack, this is what happens recently in uh, UK and it targeted a lot of hospitals. And here we need to know to measure how this denial of service attack is happening actually. How many traffic is coming from the same IP address within a, a very short period of time. So these are information that needs to be collected. So an organization needs to have enough resources and enough tools to be able to collect such information. Uh, also, uh, there needs to be a coordination between organizations to collect such information of denial of service and distributed denial of service. There's also another example of indicators that is very interesting to mention is the malware. You have to know whether there are attempts to install malware on the workstation within your organization. So a detection of work uh, for malware uh, installation, it needs to be done with an, an antivirus or an 
IPS, an intrusion prevention system. This is a system that will let you know what is actually happening without, within your network, within your system. Okay. Another example is the phishing attack. The phishing attack is sending you an email and uh, claiming that it comes from your bank, where actually it's an attacker that is sending that email. And within that email, they are pushing you to put your passwords and your login information. So these kind of phishing attacks also are now very common on the internet. And this is one way for attackers to spread like malware and ransomware within your system and network. So one, ki one kind of things that you need to measure is how many attempts of malware are done on your organization and on your system network. So just to, to, to give um, a full image of this is that the indicators are very um, new set of indicators and it's very difficult to find out what are the indicators that are really needed by your organization. And a good starting point is to uh, try to have the needed tools for that. It's try to have the needed a team based on, in your organization that will collect this information, that will uh, see the, the work on that information, correlate the information that is taken from the log from your system, that is taken from the user themselves, and also to coordinate with our, other organization within the same country or with other countries. So this is, uh, it points out on the need to set up a legal, um, like a, a big framework related to indicators that should be applied on a national, um, site and also an international site. So thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Serene, for a um, great presentation. Um, and now we're going to move to um, to Ivan. Ivan Verejo, uh, the market analyst uh, for the ICT data and uh, statistical uh, division of the ITU. Uh, uh, Ivan will uh, present the real speed um, of uh, broadband. So the floor is uh, yours, Ivan. Thank you. My presentation will be complementary to that delivered by Silvio, in that he looked at real broadband speed measurements and used, used them to inform and empower each individual user. Whereas in my presentation, I will be looking at all these individual measurements put together, combined in order to derive um, insights on the uh, aggregate uh, metrics of real broadband speed in a country. L let me start with some context. This pilot is part of the ITU project, Big Data for Measuring the Information Society. In plenary two yesterday, we had the presentation of the results of the other uh, pilot projects. All of them um, relied on data coming directly from operators, mostly call detail records and IP detail records. The uh, um, Swedish project is different from them in that data are not coming directly from the operators, but data are collected from an online speed measurement platform, which makes the scope and methodologies of this project different. Um, a few words about the online platform. It's called Bread, Breadbands Colon, and it's developed and, um, and maintained by the uh, Internet uh, Foundation in Sweden. And it looks like it's shown here in this slide. There's a, an online uh, web where people can access. They see this, they click on Start Test, and then a series of measurements are run. The results of these measurements are stored and recorded, and this is the raw data that we used in our project. This uh, online platform also allows to have an application that people can download and run the same measurements from a smartphone. Um, on the relevance of measuring uh, real internet speed, I will go fast because already has been covered by Silvio's presentation, but this is highly relevant for consumers, regulators, as well as policymakers. So the question is, can crowdsourcing internet data be used to measure real broadband speeds? And this question is relevant first because advertised speeds, which is what operators make available, um, are important but are just a small uh, part of the total path, so do not fully characterize the end user's quality of experience. 
Um, Hardware-based measurements, which would be the, the most reliable way to approach this problem, are costly, so cannot be implemented, at least not in a regular manner in, in all countries or in most countries. And so we are left with so software-based crowdsourcing. I would just like to mention some of the statistical issues that need to be considered when dealing with this kind of data, which are very similar to the statistical issues of non-probabilistic samples. Here they are listed, which I would just like to mention the most important one, which is selection bias, which arises because of the following behavior. If I'm surfing the internet and I don't have any problem, most likely I will not go and check my speed. If I'm surfing the internet and I'm facing congestion or slowdown, most pro I have more chances of going and testing my internet speed. So that makes that the uh, population that we have in the records does not fully correspond to the whole population of internet users. There are a number of solutions proposed in literature to um, face this problem. I would just uh, like to mention what's the most common approach with is that one of using ground truth data to calibrate data that you know are correct to calibrate your, your, your records. I would also like to mention, Silvia already said that there are a lot of technical issues on the measurement that need to be taken in, into consideration. I would just to me, would like to mention a major one, which is from where to where we're measuring the internet speed. On, on this uh, slide, you have the diagram of an internet connection, starting, uh, starting from point number one, the computer at home, and ending in point number five, the content located in a server somewhere in the internet. So advertised speeds, which is what the operators report, uh, measure the, uh, the, uh, the, throughput, the throughput between points two and three, which is only a part. So depending on from where to where you me you, you're measuring, you're you know, getting very different results and also answering to different questions. Here in this table, I've listed some of the uh, most well-known speed on online speed measurement platforms. Akamai, Ukla, plus also some nodes, which is Howard-based and the one we use, Breadband's colon. This is just to signal to you that they are measuring different parts of this path and using very different uh, technical implementations. And this has an impact on the results. It's not that one platform is better in absolute terms than the other. It's just that some of them are better for answering some questions, whether the others are better for answering other questions. OK. so. That was it for the uh, methodological boring discussion. Now let's go and see the data. So this is the data we have from 2011 to 2016. In dark blue, you see the uh, observations for fixed broadband speeds, so the tests run within Sweden. And you see that there are about 15 million per year. Considering that the uh, number of fixed broadband su subscriptions in Sweden is around 3.5 million, in principle, this should be quite a good enough uh, sample. A few words on the uh, data processing. Just to say that we received the data from the Internet Foundation in Sweden. We were able to store it in an SQL database. Then we transfer it to the cloud uh, using Amazon Web Services. Then we did the uh, heavy lifting data processing using Spark so that we could do in parallel and speed up the process. The uh, resulting tables were then transferred back locally and with R, the analysis was run and discharge were produced. Uh, just to signal to you that this, we were able to follow, to use the cloud for the processing because confidentiality of this data was not that high. You probably cannot do that if you are dealing with uh, call detail records. Okay, so uh, some results. If you look at the uh, blue bar, that's Redband's column, so our measurement, you see that in 2012, average uh, download speed was about 17 megabyte, me megabits per second, and in 2016, 52 megabits per second. So, okay, we see that it has increased. Now, how accurate is that? If we compare this measurement with the results of other platforms, also from Sweden, from Sweden we see that the results vary a lot. So there's sort of a consensus that there's an increase, but, you know, we cannot be very sure based on this on what's the actual speed customers have. Now on the actual sample that we had in, in, in our project. Um, the chart on the uh, left-hand side is actually the sample we were using. 
divided by the operator, so the number of observations or the percentage of observations per operator, the chart on the right-hand side is what you get if you were randomly sampling, so sort of the ground truth. You can see that there are some differences. For example, the uh, part in red refers to the uh, proportion that uh, relates to small operators, which is larger in our, in, in our sample than in the reality. And the light blue is the part that relates to the incumbent, which is um, smaller in our set compared to the uh, reality. So we see there are some differences in the sample. But do these, different, do these differences matter? We have statistical tools to provide a, a clear reply to that. So if we run a chi-square test between the two, we have a, 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 a very clear result saying that the, uh, two population, the, the two samples cannot belong to the same population, which brings us to the conclusion that we have a selection bias in the records we have. So to finalize, just some takeaway points. First, that measurement error needs to be considered, some from where to where are you measuring and some other details on the implementation. Second, mm, the fact of in-house congestion, if you are measuring from the laptop to the end, there will be a part from the laptop to up until you reach the uh, ISP's network, which is beyond the uh, control of the ISP. So if you're measuring that this, and you're trying afterwards to check this data with uh, internet service providers, they might tell you that this is actually not their fault and they will be right. Then there's the issue of selection bias that, you, that, that needs to be taken into consideration. And finally, a very important point is the importance of ground truth data, usually panel data or uh, official household survey data in order to calibrate your set, or at least in order to check whether you have biases that would invalidate the results. Here, just for your reference, some references on, on what I mentioned, and that's it for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan, uh, for an interesting uh, presentation. Um, now I would like to open the floor for questions. So if you can, please, um, get the sign of your country up, and uh, we'll have three questions, and then we'll get back to the panelists to answer them. So please, uh, if, you ca if you have a specific question to one of the panelists, please mention that. So uh, we'll start with uh, Mexico, I believe. Uh, thank you. This is Aldo Sanchez from the Mexican Telecom Regulator. Uh, congratulations to all panelists for your interest presentations. I have one question for the um, uh, telecom regulator from Italy. Um, obviously, these kind of tools are low cost to obtain really valuable information. And that's clear, I think, for everyone. But how do you compel users to use uh, mobile or fixed uh, broadband applications in order to receive information from them because I have heard other regulators that are coping with the, how they incentivize the use of these apps uh, from the people at the end. And this is something that uh, it will be interesting to know from your side. Thank you. Thank you, Mexico. Um, now we're going to have a question from uh, Portugal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, concerning the presentation from Italy, I was interested in knowing uh, what were the, the results of, of this tool? I mean, were consumers using it to uh, complain? I mean, do you have an increase in the number of complaints or do you have a number of in, uh, an increase in the number of contract terminations? And, and also, in the case of operators, are they improving the quality or are they decreasing the advertised speed? That was my first question. Uh, this, uh, the second question concerns uh, Ivan's presentation. Uh, we have, in Portugal, um, conducted a survey to determine exactly who are the people that are using these speed tests. And what we found out was that there is, in fact, uh, a selection bias. Uh, people use these uh, tests when they have problems on, or when they uh, buy a new connection. Uh, also, there is a very few number of people that uh, use these speed tests, and, but these uh, few people make lots of tests, which means that when you use this data, you have to average by IP address, otherwise you'll get uh, 
even more bias. And number three, uh, the, the tests tend to be uh, concentrated in a certain so socio-demographic uh, ca categories. Uh, people with more uh, illiteracy levels will use it, and people with less literacy levels won't use it. And I was wondering if you could uh, explain uh, something about the methods to correct this bias. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, I can, uh, we'll have a, um, a question from uh, UAE. Uh, this is Saad Naif uh, from Federal Competitiveness and Statistics Authority, UAE. Uh, I have uh, noticed that the uh, new in the data for the new indicators are already there in this in the IDI report 2017. Um, but I believe I wonder if the new ranking, as per the new methodology, uh, but as per 2017 data, not the next year data, is available. Uh, if not, we would like to have it. So better benchmark with other countries and if possible, in open data format, not in PDF format. Thank you, Yui. Um, now we'll uh, go to um, Salvio to answer a question from Mexico. Uh, we'll try to answer to both questions. Uh, of course, we uh, have a selection bias also in Italy. We have noticed uh, the same problem that uh, Ivan highlighted. And uh, usually people with uh, a problematic connection, let me say, use this software. So um, if you saw the report, a lot of them failed the test, means that the average speed is uh, lower than uh, the advertised speed. And this is uh, probably one part of the questions. The other one uh, was the reaction of the operator, if I understood. And uh, usually, first of all, the operators try to improve the quality. So they say, okay, let's try to speed up a little bit your connection. And uh, in most of the case, they succeed and uh, the user uh, remain with that uh, offer. In some case, but it's a small part, not the majority, they, uh, they can't provide the advertised speed. And in this case, the majority of this uh, minority case change operator without a penalty. Uh, in other cases, as you said, uh, they reduce the price uh, of uh, what they pay because they, pay, uh, they choose another option with a lower advertised speed. I don't know if I have answer to both questions. Okay, um, now we, uh, Ivan, want to respond to Portugal uh, question? Yes, so um, uh, I think regarding the, uh, I just covered there shortly in the presentation selection bias, as, as Portugal was raising, there's also the issue of unequal participation when these tests are run not compulsory, but at the choice of each user. Um, the way that this platform, Breadbands Colin, has of differentiating or counting each individual user when they, when they do it online, but also in the app, is using some cookies. So they, they have a way, actually, of getting rid of that. Unfortunately, in the data they shared with us, we, we, could not, we, we did not have this information, so we also had the, the issue of un uh, unequal participation. On how to correct the bias, I, I think this is a, still sort of a research question open. The, uh, some of the results that have already been successful involve the uh, calibration of the data with some other stronger ground truth data. So for instance, I think that it was the statistics office in, in the Netherlands that at some point in the past, they, 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 used, they had a panel a uh, consumer panel in which they introduced the same measurement platform. And then they ran some um, control tests which they had the control with. And also, they, this way, they were able to link these results also with demographics. And then using this panel data that now had the results of the test, they were able to actually correct the data from the non-panel data. That's an option, but that has also some cost implications. In, term of, in terms of adding that to, to, to the panel. There are 
maybe other options that uh, the colleagues from Flowminder mentioned in their presentation from yesterday, but this is, this is open for yet for, for discussion. Thanks. Okay, um, Anigo, you wanna uh, respond to the um, IDI question from your EU? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I would like to, to reply just very briefly to the, if, if the replication of the results given the new indicators that are being proposed and agreed upon, uh, if the replication is possible, well, this uh, hugely will depend on the quality and the amount of data uh, to be collected from ITU in the very near future. I recall that there are five new indicators. This is a tremendous effort for everyone to provide the data, <coughs> later for ITU to collect it, to validate it, to check it out, and then to run, of course, some uh, test on how the rankings will, will look like. But I recall that this will be in the long questionnaire. You will be receiving it by, like, by merge, so that I take profit of, the, of your question to insist on the importance of providing all the data that is being requested in the long questionnaire. Otherwise, some exercises will be impossible. And I recall as well that there are five new indicators, which means that uh, you know, these indicators will exist only with one observation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nigo. Um, I think due to uh, time and a uh, very heavy subject that we had in this uh, presentation from uh, the great panelists in here, um, we're gonna, I'm sorry that we're going to close the floor for questions, and I'm going to pass the floor to uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Habib. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for this uh, moderation. Thank you for the panelists, for the deep information that we get and uh, for the question, because the question was very interesting from a practical perspective.